Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly. You just woke up, didn't you? I actually have intended to start a second channel. I'll have that linked below. There's nothing on there yet. However, I'm still kind of planning on what sort of content I want to put on there. So let me know down below in the comments what you guys would want to see from a second channel, what kind of things you would want, if that's vlogs or um, anything else on my end. Just let me know in the comments. All right, Mr. Boys. And if you haven't, you can follow me on my socials for miscellaneous things and announcements over there. So with all of that out of the way, let's just get right into the video. Today's topic is tornadoes of the 1990s. Now, if you've been following me for a little while, you know that I, a while back, did a Tornadoes of the Decade video on 1980s twisters. However, as someone who was born in 1995, of course, the 90s hold a very special place in my heart. One disclaimer that I do want to make before we get started, though, is that I have already covered in depth a lot of the major 90s twisters. We have talked about the more 1999 twister. I've done a video on the 1997 Gerald, Texas event. I've talked about the 1990 Plainfield tornado and the 1991 Andover Twister. So if you are interested in any of those particularly, I'm not going to talk about them in this video because I've already covered them extensively in their own pieces. So you can go check those out. They're all here on my channel if you're interested. So without further ado, let's talk about the tornadoes of the 90s. The 1990s were an incredible decade filled with culture and innovation. There were cell phones, the PlayStation, internet for commercial use, Beanie Babies, the movie Twister, and Jim Cantori. In the weather world, things were rapidly expanding. In 1991 and 2, laws were passed that allowed the National Weather Service to modernize technology, to now include things like Doppler radar, and also to begin to employ ASOS systems, which allowed for significant expansion of information available to forecasters and aviators, both of which were huge steps forward. It's also during this time in the 90s that networks like the Weather Channel were in their prime, producing some of the most iconic TV meteorologist and quality content. And on top of that, storm chasing as a hobby was only beginning to skyrocket. But of course, along with that growth, the 1990s also saw some of the most prolific and horrifying tornadoes and outbreaks in our recent history. So let's take a look at some of those now. These are the tornadoes and outbreaks of the 1990s. In no particular order, we're going to start with a tornado that's been heavily requested on this channel, and that is the Birmingham F5. One of the most infamous tornadoes of the 1990s, the Birmingham F5, overshadows what was actually a multi-day tornado outbreak. From April 6th to April 9th of 1998, a total of 62 tornadoes crossed portions of the Midwest, spanning into the Mid-Atlantic and Southern states. The most notable by far was the Birmingham F5. On the evening of April 8th, 1998, a supercell, a supercell spawned a wicked storm, which would go on to produce three tornadoes in total. The first of which began in eastern Pickens County at 7.01 p.m. And although it largely stayed through rural portions, it did manage to get up to F3 strength in its first leg, thankfully with zero fatalities. The second tornado from this parent supercell, however, wouldn't be so forgiving. At 7.42 p.m., the second twister of three would touch down in Tuscaloosa County, Moving into Jefferson County only minutes later, the estimated wind speed at its peak was somewhere over 260 miles per hour as it moved through portions of Oak Grove, Concord, Pleasant Grove, and Edgewater, only lifting just four miles short of the Birmingham airport. During this process, it destroyed a mobile home park, 
multiple well-built homes and tossed cars like toys. Immediately after the twister lifted, the Rock Creek Church of God was turned into a makeshift trauma center where tragically 11 people would lose their lives. Even after this horrific F5 twister lifted from Birmingham, the parent supercell would go on to produce a third and final F2 twister that took another two lives in a mobile home. In total, 32 people lost their lives to this parent supercell and the tornadoes with more than 250 injuries. More than a thousand homes were destroyed with 900 more heavily damaged, meaning thousands in the Birmingham area were displaced. The Birmingham Twister was of course ultimately rated an F5, was estimated to be three quarters of a mile in width at its peak and traveled just over 30 miles. This tornado remains the seventh deadliest in Alabama state history and certainly will be one that the locals remember for the rest of their lives. The next F5 in the year 1998 came shockingly just a week after the Birmingham Twister, only a little bit to the north in the western portions of Tennessee. As a Tennessee native myself, I am fully aware that this state is no stranger to tornadoes. However, outside of two Alabama twisters that crossed into the Tennessee borders in the 1974 and 2011 outbreaks, Tennessee has only ever seen two F5s in its recorded history one of which actually was in 1923 and was only rated an F5 several decades later using photos. So the Lawrenceburg tornado in many ways was incredibly prolific, even for West Tennessee, which is quite tornado prone. On the evening of April 16th, 1998, a tornado outbreak would heavily impact Middle Tennessee. Almost unbelievably, more than 20 supercells were identified on radar that went on to produce 10 confirmed tornadoes in the state. And to me, that's pretty reminiscent of the 1974 super outbreak. Almost every single cell was going on to produce hook echoes that were clearly visible on radar. And interestingly enough, although Lawrence County in Tennessee was struck by pretty much the only ever F5 to be, to be produced in the state, this violent twister was overwhelmingly overshadowed by three twisters that struck downtown Nashville on the same night. Part of the reason the Lawrenceburg tornado received so little media attention, understandably so, was because it went through largely rural stretches versus the Nashville tornadoes which hit the downtown regions. And in many ways, thankfully so. It was really a miracle that this horrifically violent twister didn't move through heavily populated areas. Many well-built homes with anchor bolts in place were swept clean. One truck in this rural stretch was even rumored to be carried several miles. Incredibly, there were no fatalities associated with this storm, only 21 injuries. The National Weather Service has a great document published on this tornado specifically with a mesoscale discussion and synoptic overview. If you're interested, I will have it linked below. You've heard of the 1965 Palm Sunday outbreak, but some of you might not know that there's another outbreak from 1994 referred to as the Palm Sunday outbreak as well. On March 27th, 1994, a rare high risk was issued over the Southern states in Georgia, all the way into the Carolinas. And for good reason. That day, 29 twisters would touch down, spanning from the state of Texas all the way up into North Carolina, the worst of which included an F4 in Alabama, in Ragland, Piedmont, and Rock Run. The storm was moving at a forward speed of 55 miles per hour, so quickly that it took the lives of two people who were caught off guard, one woman who was in a campground, and a man who was thrown in his truck. Eventually, the twister would directly hit the Goshen United Methodist Church in this small community where 20 people lost their lives, 
and another 90 were injured. Locals claim they had no warning at this church before it was struck. The walls of the church, although strong, were made of masonry brick and ultimately collapsed on the congregation from the force of this violent storm. Within the entire outbreak, this F4 alone took 22 lives and caused some $50 million in damage. But unfortunately, this wasn't the only violent tornado produced in the 1994 Palm Sunday outbreak. Another F4 twister moved through Rome and Canton, this time in Georgia, of which the most intense damage occurred in the rural portions of Canton where two-story brick homes in a neighborhood were leveled at Indian Spring subdivision, along with two businesses and a total of 12 poultry houses in its path. The tornado was reported to have been a mile wide at its peak, where it very tragically took the lives of three people and some 500,000 chickens. In total, 40 people lost their lives in this outbreak and some 500 people were injured in just under 24 hours. Of all the tornado imagery that I have looked at in my spare time or talked about on this channel, I think I have to say with some level of confidence that this is one of the most menacing looking tornadoes I've ever seen. I've heard several times in my many years in the weather space that the worst tornadoes come oftentimes from the last leg of an outbreak, and that would be true for the Heston tornado. This horrifying twister came as the final blow to a multi-day outbreak that began on March 11th, 1990. After multiple days of severe weather and tornado outbreaks, on March 13th, 1990, the devastating Heston F5 Twister began just north of Pretty Prairie in Reno County. After traveling several miles through rural stretches, the Twister approaches the western sections of Heston, Kansas. Here, in its peak intensity, the Twister would destroy over 220 homes and 20 businesses in this western portion of the town alone. After leaving Heston, the tornado would continue to cause damage in Harvey County, where it caused some $25 million in damage as it continued northeast before eventually undergoing a merger and joining with another supercell. The parent supercell actually went on to produce another twister. The tornado ultimately injured 60 residents and took the lives of two one of which was a young boy who was sheltering in the basement with his parents, and the other was an elderly woman in Gosel, Kansas. In total, the March 13th outbreak alone caused 59 tornadoes to be produced, of which multiple were strong and really impressive photogenic tornadoes, of which included these two F5 twisters north and east of Wichita. The National Weather Service, of course, has an incredible document outlining the strong and violent tornadoes from this event, so I'll have that linked below if you want to take a closer look. We are all familiar with May 3rd, 1999, a day that will go in tornado history for a long, long time. Although we all know it to be the day that the Bridge Creek Moor tornado was produced, it actually was a part of a larger outbreak that produced 152 tornadoes in the span of a week, more than half of which came on May 3rd through 4th, 1999. I want to, of course, just express again that the only reason I'm not talking about the Bridge Creek Moor tornado is because I've already done a full video on it, which I will have linked or in the cards somewhere for you to watch if you want to. So let's take a look at one of those, the Mulhall tornado. Only a few short hours after the incredibly devastating Moore tornado, another supercell would begin to form and ultimately wreak havoc on the metropolitan area of Oklahoma City. At 9.25 p.m., what would go on to become another infamous tornado touched down in Logan County, Oklahoma, eventually producing a wedge tornado that would hit the town of Mulhall. 
After the Doppler on wheels caught the Bridge Creek Moor tornado, it actually was present for the Mulhall tornado as it progressed through the town, observing at times that the twister exceeded one mile in width, with the core flow circulation maintaining a distance of 5,200 feet, making it quantitatively the largest tornado ever measured. This multi-vortex tornado destroyed an estimated 60 to 70% of the 130 homes in Mulhall, including the elementary school and the town's water tower. Interestingly enough, many meteorologists and storm chasers firmly believe that the Mulhall tornado may have been just as violent, if not more violent, than the Bridge Creek Moor tornado. The difference being that it didn't hit a majorly populated area like Moore, Oklahoma, and the Mulhall Twister ultimately got an F4 rating. This incredible storm has been extensively reviewed and studied since the Doppler on Wheels got incredible information on it, so I will link some of those publications if you want some really in-depth information about this Twister. Between November 21st through the 23rd of 1992, a total of 95 tornadoes would move through the Midwest and Southern states, taking the lives of 26 and injuring over 600 in what is now known as the widespread outbreak. Though I do want to mention it is often disputed the total number of tornadoes that this outbreak caused. Some sources quote up to 140 tornadoes being possible rather than the listed 95. One F4 moved through the northern portions of Dayton in Texas, where it reached one mile in width over the Channel View area where 270 homes were destroyed or damaged. This twister was among a slew of other tornadoes in the northern part of this outbreak. One F4 would cause tragedy in Hopewell, Mississippi, where 12 people lost their lives and over 120 were injured. And Mississippi wasn't just hit with one F4. Yet another F4 struck the communities of Wisner and Newton, a mile-wide wedge tornado that destroyed over 100 homes and the local church. What's interesting to me about this outbreak particularly as well is the fact that it caused violent tornadoes in northern Georgia, which is exceedingly rare. One violent F4 touched down in Cobb County in Georgia near Marietta and Kennesaw, where over 300 homes were destroyed and 46 people were injured and another F4 in Etheridge, Georgia, where five people lost their lives from another mile-wide wedge. Dozens of homes and five farms were destroyed, which again took the lives of five people and over 350 cattle. This outbreak would cause a total of $300 million in damage in the 1992 currency rate and is pretty shocking in terms of a southern outbreak with the amount of violent tornadoes that went through northern Georgia. So overall, while a lot of these tornadoes and outbreaks were incredibly devastating in their own right, the tornadoes of the 90s are unique because they were a catalyst for real change. Because of some of the more catastrophic tornadoes that happened in the 90s, Doppler radars were becoming increasingly in demand across the country. Not only that, we got our first incredible close-up video footage of tornadoes, which was incredibly beneficial for the scientific community to better understand how tornadoes work up close. It's also part of what helped storm chasing begin to skyrocket into the community that it is today. Some of the most devastating tornadoes in our recorded history, like Moore of 1999, brought the most change to meteorology. Not only did Moore bring more questions to safety and concerns for sheltering, particularly under overpasses, the Moore 99 tornado is also the exact reason we have tornado emergencies in existence today, something that I am confident has saved countless lives since its implementation. And I think that's really all we can ask for, in my opinion. While we can't change the fact that violent and devastating tornadoes happen, we can learn from these tragedies so that we can better prepare ourselves for the next one to prevent unnecessary loss of life. 
And honestly, I think the 90s tornadoes did just that. So yeah, that's all I have in terms of 90s tornadoes for today. And I think that pretty much wraps it up. I will eventually continue the tornadoes of the decade. Next time, I guess, will be the 2000s, or I might actually pop back and do the 70s. We will see, but I'll definitely continue this series because I think it's a really fun one to do. If you want to help support the channel, the best way to do so is to subscribe if you're not already. If you really want to help me out, you can like the video or leave a comment down below. I would love to hear what you guys want to see from a second channel from me, what kind of content you want. Follow my social media if you want to. That's really pretty much it. Thank you for just being a part of this community and for always being kind and gracious to me. It means a lot. Yeah, that's it. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.